Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions. Regardless of whether you will apply to a particular school being highlighted, you should listen to all of the episodes as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process, prompting you to come up with your own follow-up questions for when you visit campus or meet with a college admissions representative yourself. Lastly, if you have any questions you'd like me to cover on future episodes or any comments you'd like to share, please email me at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit our website at www.collegeadmissionstalk.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Timothy Lee, who is the Vice President for Enrollment Management at Lemoyne College in beautiful Syracuse, New York. Tim, thank you so much for being here today. How are you? John, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Uh, We're doing well. Looking forward to the chat. Looking forward to it. It is our honor and pleasure. So, Tim, let me ask you, what is it about Lemoyne College that makes it so appealing for so many students to want to apply and ultimately attend? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I think we have a great academic reputation, which I think is, uh, is, is very important. And I think when students visit or, or families visit, they, they really do feel the community and the family here that, um, you know, faculty go out of their way to make them feel welcomed, um, try to answer all their questions. And, you know, I've, I've worked at a number of different places and sometimes that's, that's kind of like a sales pitch. But I think that's one thing that students say once they're here that they truly feel that how they felt during their visit, during, during the application process, during the review process, that um, those feelings stayed with them throughout their four years here. So I think that's a lot uh, to do with it. Uh, I think we do a really great job preparing students for, for life, right? Whether that's graduate school or, or the job afterwards. Um, and, you know, uh, we're, we're a Jesuit college. Uh, it's a 500 year old tradition. And while I think a lot of students don't necessarily look for that or know what that means on the way in, they're glad that they received those benefits while they were here. And uh, it, it reflects really well in our exit surveys that, um, you know, the, the Jesuit values that they're taught here, no matter what their discipline is. Well, we appreciate that. The academic reputation. I read that you were written up for being one of the best values in the country at Lemoyne College. And you mentioned the Jesuit nature of Lemoyne. Tim, could you elaborate on that? What exactly is the Jesuit philosophy? Yeah, so uh, like I mentioned, it goes back 500 years, um, and and we're one of 27 Jesuit institutions in the United States. Um, it's really you know care of the whole person, or or as we say, uh, care of personalis uh, in the Jesuit vernacular. Um, what does that mean? You know, you're you're not just going to come here and learn a topic. You're going to learn how that topic impacts the world. So you can come here and study finance and learn how to make money for people and and be be well off yourself, but you're going to learn to do it in an ethical way. You're going to learn that if you are well off, um, how do you make the community around you better? If you're going to study nursing, it's not just solving an ailment. It's how do you deal with the psychological uh, uh, needs of the patient? How do you handle the family? Um, it's not just uh, trying to, you know, heal somebody. It's it's all the, all that goes along with that. Um, and then, you know, the other word that we use quite a bit is the, is, uh, the modus, which is more. And, and you know, no matter what your goals are, no matter what it is you want to do, um, is that good enough, right? And, and how can you always strive to be better and, and make the world around you a little bit better? So I think that really resonates with students these days, especially those who are really uh, interested in, you know, activism and and the social welfare of, of the communities around us. Well, I appreciate that. And of course, making the community better, how are you going to contribute? 
Those are tremendous values. In addition, again, to the tremendous academic opportunities that you have for your students on campus. So let's talk a little bit about off campus and time outside of the classroom, Tim. What can you tell us about life on and off campus at LeMoyne College? Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned, you know, we are in Syracuse. Uh, Syracuse is a, is a decent sized city, um, you know, especially in New York State. Uh, it's a college town. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're, we also border on the town of DeWitt. So, so you really have the best of both worlds. You're, you're five minutes from downtown, but you're also in a very uh, suburban, safe location. Um, you know, throughout outside the classroom, certainly uh, we promote leadership. We have a lot of leadership opportunities. Entrepreneurship is very big on our campus. Uh, we know that students learn differently now than they did pre-COVID. Clubs, activities, uh, community service, uh, study abroad is all very big. Um, we, we have a, a really special performing arts uh, community here on campus. And um, not only do they do their own performing arts, but they get involved with the performing arts community, not only in Syracuse, but also throughout New York State. Um, and, and our athletic program is certainly well known. Um, and, and I think we do really well from an athletic point of view, but not just varsity athlete athletics, but club and, and intramurals as well. So, um, we like to give students the opportunities to engage in the community, but at the same time, uh, keep them busy outside of the classroom and turn them into the leaders that we want to graduate. Well, we appreciate that overview. And I particularly like the fact that you talked about that it's a safe location. That's something that's obviously very important to a lot of the parents out there. And of course, the students. So we appreciate that, Tim. And so could you walk us through the overall application process at LeMoyne, such as, Tim, do you evaluate by high school, by region, intended major? Whatever insight that you could offer would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, sure. So we, we do a little bit of everything. I would say about 90% uh, of our applicants are read by the counselor who serves that territory. So, so for instance, um, you know, our, our person who visits high schools in Long Island will read all of the applications from Long Island. We like the fact that um, they work with the same students through the process for sometimes 18 to 24 months. Um, they're familiar with the schools. They, they get familiar with the school counselors. And um, we just think it really works really well that way. In central New York, right, simply because it's our, it's our you know, we have a lot of feeder schools in central New York. Uh, we will break up the high schools by uh, certain individuals. So, for instance, I, I have five or six high schools that I read exclusively. Um, and then you have a few outliers. And, and those are, um, are, are, I think, our academic programs that are a little more, uh, that, that are tougher to get into, right? Um, our nursing program, our, uh, we have a direct entry uh, PA program. Um, so those will all be read by the counselor who manage those uh, programs. And, and what's nice about that is you have consistency from who's reviewing them. They eliminate the bias from, okay, uh, this is my high school, right? They, they read them all collectively. Um, so those are the few of the programs that would have additional processes, you know, different reviews, um, possibly interviews that, that are required by that. Um, but overall, you know, we, um, we, we try to get through the applications as, as quickly as possible. We, we try to do a fair evaluation. Uh, certainly, if we need more information, we, we, we feel that we're connected enough with the counseling community that we can reach out and get some additional information or wait for mid-year grades or, or something like that. Um, and I think ultimately, right, we, we want to make college accessible. Um, we, we try to eliminate barriers or, or games that some schools might have to play in order to, to you know, make their profile look a little different. Um, so it's important for us to be as, as transparent in the process as, as possible. Well, we appreciate that. And obviously, like you said, your counselors are familiar with the schools, but also the guidance counselors that work in the various high schools within the tri-state area and beyond. But I'm curious, Tim, how do you differentiate if one school, for example, offers a multitude of APs, for example, one school that offers 20 APs and another perhaps that only offers five, how do you differentiate between the two during your overall application process? Yeah, that, and that's a good question. Um, you know, we we have a um, we have a rigor index that that we do use that that is factored into a review process, um, and that's something that we adjust you know each year, right? But you know, I also think it's important that we review an application within the confines of the school that the the students attending. Um, you know, I, I've been doing this for twenty three years, and and I've had 
parents call me saying, well, if, if my son went to this school instead of this school, they would have had a 95 average instead of an 85 average. And, and my answer is typically, I, I, I don't know what, if that's true or not, right? I can only base an evaluation on, on where the student went. Um, and I think that's, that's part of a holistic process, right? Um, you know, we know some schools are, are very well resourced and some aren't. Um, and, you know, some students have different challenges, which, which is why for me, you know, a, a GPA, a, a test score is, is just part of the story, right? We, we, we want to make sure a student can be successful, right? The worst thing we can do is admit someone and, and have them not be successful or, or have them, you know, fail out or, or not come back because they're not happy. Um, so we, we try to do that within the confines of the schools and uh, trying to understand where the student is in relation to the school they're going to. Hey, John, this is Alina from the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. Dormify makes shopping for college totally stress-free. They've truly thought about everything and have nailed small space living. From the charging storage carts to the charging headboards, they have so many products that are both functional and stylish. They even sell bags that make move-in day easier. I couldn't survive dorm living without the extra storage from Dormify. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Alina, for introducing Dormify to our listeners. Dormify is a one-stop shop for stylish and functional dorm decor, offering a wide range of stylish and functional products for anyone looking to decorate their dorms or small spaces. From bedding to wall decorations to storage solutions, Dormify has everything you need to transform your living space into a comfortable and stylish home away from home. Use our exclusive coupon code College Talk. That's one word, College Talk, to save fifteen percent on most products when you shop at Dormify.com or through the link provided in the show notes. Please note that if you make a purchase through the affiliate link or coupon code we provided, the podcast will receive a small commission from Dormify. But rest assured, we would only promote products that we truly believe in and think will benefit our listeners. And now back to the show. Well, we appreciate that. And Tim, could you share what is your mid 50% range in terms of GPA and any other information that you collect, such as SAT or ECT scores? And if a student falls below that mid 50, what are some of the things that they can do to enhance their overall application? Our overall GPA is about a 3.5. So that middle 50% is about a 3.3 to a 3.7 or so like that. Um, and, you know, uh, same with, you know, test scores as well, right? We are optional. I know we'll probably talk about that in a little bit. Um, our, our, our middle range is, um, you know, our average SAT is about 1210. Um, you know, so, so the middle range is about 1180 to 1240. Um, you know, I, I would answer that question now a little bit differently versus pre COVID, right? Um, Again, we try to look at holistic, right? Two students with the same GPA in the same classes can tell very different stories, right? Did a student improve or did a student go the opposite direction? Um, was a student involved? And, and if they were involved, are they, are they jotting down 20 clubs just to say I showed up to a meeting or are they doing five things very passionately? Um, so I think there's a lot of different stories in there. Uh, I'm a big fan of students who self-advocate, right? Um, there, there's going to be some students who just aren't going to meet certain thresholds for some of our programs. They can still come to Lemoyne and, and there's, there's pathways for them to get there if that's where they eventually want to be. But a 17 year old is not supposed to figure out what they want to do for the rest of their lives at, at the same time. <laughs> so I think, you know, we, we pride ourselves on, on that, the personal relationships at Lemoyne. So I feel the, um, the more we get to know a student, we can look beyond the grades, right. Um, and at least take cons other factors into consideration, um, which I think is important. And recently, with everyone going test optional, the mid 50% in terms of the SAT and ACT scores may be a little skewed because only students that have solid scores are submitting. Yeah. Are you seeing that, that your mid 50% in terms of SAT and ACT scores, is it on the rise? Yeah, it's it's on the rise. And, and yes, uh, I think, yes, you have your students who aren't submitting the scores. You also have students who I think are applying to different levels of institutions and um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example, right? Uh, we're in central New York. We, we do cross with, with Cornell in certain markets, right? Um, you know, what Cornell is looking for, right, to be considered, um, you know, we, we would love to take those scores, right? So someone could has put in their application, 
you know, we know that they're applying to Cornell or, or uh, another highly selective institution that, that um, you know, and they want to put in higher test scores and they feel that, you know, um, maybe that won't be good enough. So they put on their common app, don't count my scores, right? So I think we counsel the students to, hey, you know, um, maybe you should consider these scores. And, you know, at the same time, um, you know, how you perform on a three hour test, I have initials after my name and, and the three times I took the SAT, my, my critical reading score was uh, much, much to be desired. And, and when I sit with staff members in my career and they say, this student only has this, I try to remind them that your boss, you have to call doctor in public, uh, had lower scores than that. So, so I think it comes down to the grit and, and um, but you know, if for those who want us to consider them, we will consider them, but we also, our job is to counsel them through that process as well. Well, we appreciate that. And so what are the different ways a student may apply to Lemoyne? And is there a benefit to applying one way over the other? So we, we basically have three different ways. Uh, we have our own homegrown application. Um, we're members of Common App and we're also uh, this year, we're members of the, the coalition through SCORE. A majority of our applications come through Common App. Um, you know, we, we don't we don't have a preference, right? Um, whatever's easier for the student, it's a stressful enough time. Um, we're going to eliminate as many hoops as we can that students have to jump through in order to apply. We're going to read them all the same. Um, and, and uh, you know, if a student has a question about that, we'll, we'll happy to help them out through that. Well, I appreciate that. And Tim, I always put the Office of Undergraduate Admissions, of course, in this case, it's for Lemoyne, in the show notes. If there's any other link that you want me to include, just provide it to me. And of course, I'll put it in the show notes for the students and the parents. Great. And Tim, you mentioned this earlier, the fact that Lemoyne is currently test optional. What can you share in terms of the percentage of students that apply and that are ultimately admitted in terms of the percentage that did not submit their test scores? Yeah, um, we've, we've seen it change over the last few years. And, and as we've got through COVID, um, we've become, I guess, more optional, right? We were always optional except for certain programs <laughs> or for certain considerations. But as we hit COVID, right, we talked to the faculty and said, you know, I know you require tests for this. You're not going to have a class, right? Because some students weren't able to take the exams. Um, so, so we're 100% optional. I don't see us ever moving away from that. In fact, I believe we were one of the first Jesuit colleges to, to go test optional. Um, and I think some people thought we were crazy. And now a lot of them are, are test optional. Um, only about 30 to 33% of our incoming class uh, gave us test scores. And um, so that's, that's, you know, I, I've been here for about five years. So it, it went from about 55, 60% down, down to about a third. And, you know, we're, we're fine with that, right? Our, our retention has um, remained really solid, right? We're, we're, we've actually, our retention's above our 10-year average, right? So, you know, we feel that our review that we do of the high school transcript is, is really the best indicator of success. Well, you kind of touched upon the next question that I was going to ask because you're looking at your retention rate you're not seeing much of a uh, negative difference. So let me just ask you anyway, Tim, where do you see the test optional trend going in the future? Yeah, I, I think it's gonna continue. I think you're gonna see more uh, institutions and, and state systems not require it. Um, and you know, I think some schools are doing uh, you know pilot programs for three or four years. It'll be interesting to see some of the results of that. Um, you know, we know MIT went back to, uh, you know, requiring tests and they had their rationale and, and um, I don't fault them for that. Um, but I think when, um, you know, when you, when you see all the additional stress that the tests put on and, um, you know, most of us who, who work in this field don't see a correlation between high test scores and, and success, right? I think you're going to see more and more institutions not require and, and go the SAT optional route. Well, we appreciate that. And obviously the next few years are going to be very interesting because a lot of reps are reporting just that. Mm -hmm. They're new to the test optional world. And so they want to collect data over the next three, four years to see if there are any significant differences. So we appreciate that, Tim. Thank you. And speaking of tests, what about AP, IB, and dual enrollment classes? Does Lemoyne College accept them for credit? Yes, we do. Um, yeah, I, I'd probably say almost all or, or a vast majority of students coming in have, have some level of pre Lemoyne credits that they're, they're coming in with. Um, you know, I think we're pretty liberal with what we take, but at the same time, so for instance, if, if you're a biology major, we're going to want to see a higher level of, um, 
you know, success in, in those courses or in those tests than, than just like a pass, um, you know, simply because it's going to set you up for, for future success. But uh, yeah, we're, we're, you know, we welcome that. Uh, a lot of schools in central New York have dual enrollment programs with uh, area community colleges, and, and we work with them on that as well. And what are some examples of college essays that really stuck with you, Tim? And what advice would you share with prospective students in terms of what to think about when they're sitting down getting ready to write that college essay? Yeah, th- that, this is a great question. And, and I mean, you, we can do an hour workshop on this, right? Um, <laughs> th- there, you know, there's no magical formula, I, I think, right? Um, so so I, I think there's three essays that have stood out to me. And, and again, I've done this for about 23 years. Um, one is one that I read this year. And um, I think a, a, a young lady talked about you know, her own mental health issues without just coming out and saying it. Right. And she started off with saying, you know, she likes to fix broken things. She talked about herself and then talked about how the people around here who are broken, you know, she wants to help. So I just felt that that was very honest. Um, Another one I read a few years ago, um, a, a, a young man was talking about playing baseball and he started out, you know, it was the bottom of the ninth inning and, you know, he was up and he told the story of the baseball game and this hit that he hit off the wall and how he was rounding all the bases, but also how it paralleled with his life. And the essay ended before we knew if he scored or not. <laughs> and, and I think four or five of us read it separately without talking to each other. And we were all like, did you read that essay? And when we finally met the young man, he said, Oh yeah, I scored. I just, I wanted to hold you all, you know, in suspense. <laughs> um, and then the third one, um, which I wouldn't recommend you do, but this is such an outlier in all the essays I've read. Uh, there was a young man who actually wrote an essay about mocking the entire college visit process. Wow. <laughs> now, I don't take myself too seriously and I like humor. So I, I like the fact that they went with this approach. Um, luckily, he was admissible. Right. Um, and when I finally met the young man, uh, he, had a, he had a laugh about it. And I said, I hope it wasn't this institution uh, this was a previous institution I worked at. He's like, he's like, uh, if, if it was this institution, I wouldn't be here right now. Um, you know, so, so it's, I, I think what's important is, and I'll give, I'll, I'll give a, a couple of examples and, and, you know, this could be a sensitive topic as well. I want to read something about you that I can't read by looking at your, your application or what your school counselor or your recommendation is going to write. If you're just reiterating what's on your transcript then you're not telling me anything special about you, right? And and the essay is the one part where it's really about you. That's one area you have control over, right? What you did in 10th grade English is over and done with, right? What what a principal or a school counselor writes about you, you can't control. So so I think that's really important. And I think it's important to be original and, you know, um, having fun with it, right? It, it, this isn't a... Uh, I don't think this is this isn't a senior thesis that you get a thumbs up or thumbs down and you can graduate or not. Right. Um, The one thing that, you know, I've I've spent my entire career in New York, right, at New York institutions. And um, there's been three major instances, uh, incidents in New York in my time that I've read thousands and thousands of essays about. And and one is 9-11. The second one is, uh, you know, Superstorm Sandy, which, you know, hit Long Island, Staten Island really hard. And the third one is is COVID, right? And while everybody has their own story in relation to those, those situations, right? What happens is the first one you read is riveting, right? And then the second one you read is, is riveting, but, you know, maybe 99% is riveting. You know, by the time you get to the 50th essay about, you know, Superstorm Sandy, you've read what you've, you, you, you're not hearing anything different, right? So while those have a personal impact on a family and, and certainly we would love to know that, you know, I think you have to think about, is everybody else in my cohort writing about this as well? Right. Um, so I think being original, and if you are going to use a topic like that, spin it in a way that I, maybe I don't know you're talking about a life changing event that 40 other students are until I get to the bottom of the essay. So I think that's, that's some advice that, that I would give. Well, those are great pieces of advice. You shared examples that you really liked. You gave that one that you recommend, you liked it, but you recommend that you don't do something like that. Right. And you talk about the overall application, right? There's multiple parts and each part needs to build on the next. So to your point, an essay, you shouldn't be reiterating what's already there in the 
transcript on the activity sheet or what have you. So I really appreciate that answer, Tim. Thank you. And of course, the teacher letters of recommendation are obviously another part of the overall application. What are you looking for in terms of helping to enhance an application from the teacher's letters? And if you could provide any examples, Tim, that would be great. Yeah. You know, and, and when you say uh, recommendation, right, I think we also see this trend of going away from, uh, you know, paragraphs in a story to almost bullet points, right? And, um, you know, so so we're seeing that pick up quite a bit. You know, I think what we're looking for in a recommendation is, again, not to reiterate what's what's on the transcript or what's in the rec- what's in the, the the activity section, for instance, but you know, hopefully someone who knows you well enough that can speak to your character and speak to either how hard you work or what did you overcome or what impact you left in the high school or the community that you're coming from. I think that's all very important. I also think it's important that you know without that recommendation or without context of a recommendation. Let's say, for instance, um, you know, I struggled in in tenth grade geometry, right? You know, I, I, maybe maybe I got a D in it. And as someone who's reading an application, I may say, well, that that student just didn't care; they didn't put in the effort. So, so if there is a bump in the road, and it's you know, it's because something happened, right? I'd like to see that the the recommendation or someone who wrote a recommendation can reference that because it without that, I'm looking. I don't know the context. It could have been. They had three teachers that year. It could have been that the student was sick or they had a death in the family and that impacted one class. Um, so I think, you know, character is, is important, right? And um, I think, uh, you, you know, just some context about some some grades or some performance that would be an outlier in an application is important. I want to welcome back Sean Patel, who is the founder and CEO of Prep Expert. He's a Shark Tank entrepreneur making a deal with Mark Cuban back in 2016. And he's also a board certified dermatologist who received a perfect score on his SAT. Sean, welcome back. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back, John. So I just wanted to share with all your listeners real quick that we have an amazing partnership with the College Admissions Process Podcast, and we have a really special offer for all of your listeners. So for any listener who wants to enroll their student into one of our prep expert SAT courses, ACT courses, or one-on-one tutoring programs, You can get 30% off just for being a listener of the College Admissions Process Podcast. All you need to do is put in the promo code College Talk, one word, just College Talk, and that'll give you 30% off all Prep Expert SAT courses, ACT courses, or one on one tutoring packages. Make sure you use the link in the show notes of the College Admissions Process Podcast. Thank you, Sean. We really appreciate it. To our listeners, as an affiliate partner with Prep Expert, I want to be transparent with you that for every purchase made using our coupon code, which is College Talk, the College Admissions Process Podcast will receive a small commission from Prep Expert. But rest assured that we only promote programs that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. For more information, please see the Prep Expert affiliate partnership link in the show notes. And now let's get back to the show. Well, we appreciate that. And again, it talks to enhancing the overall application. Each part has to build on the next. So students, if something happened in a particular class, when you ask your teacher to write the letter of recommendation, there's nothing wrong with asking the teacher to perhaps mention that story. Maybe something you contributed to. Maybe it was a conversation in class. Maybe it was a project. Maybe it was a humanitarian effort. I don't know. But if there was something that was a deviation from the norm that occurred, something new to add to your application, don't be shy. Just ask the teacher if they wouldn't mind talking about it to, again, enhance your overall application. And the worst thing that could happen is they say no, which, you know, is fine. But the answer to every question you don't ask is no students. So don't be shy. Ask the question if something special happened, that's going to enhance your overall application. Yeah. I would also add, you know, the toughest thing is, is someone who's going into their senior year, trying to find their, their favorite English, uh, English teacher to write that recommendation. <laughs> and that same teacher is being asked by 45 other students. I, I think, right. you know, for, for, for 
parents or students who are, you know, in ninth and 10th grade, you need to start thinking about who's going to write your recommendation now. And if you, you hit it off with a, uh, a teacher or a coach or, or somebody else in ninth or 10th grade, keep in contact with that person. And, and before you leave junior year, say, Hey, I'd really like if you write a recommendation, then that, that person has all summer to at least reflect on it as opposed to, you know, we all know what it's like coming back at the beginning of a school year or a semester. It's absolutely crazy. So uh, just, just give those recommend the, those writing the recommendation time to give a fair assessment. Well, those are great pieces of advice. And, you know, as someone who has written many over the years as a high school principal, and even when I was a teacher, it's always appreciated when someone comes to you in the spring of junior year to say, hey, would you mind writing this recommendation letter for me? And of course, I always do. But to your point, you know, myself, all the teachers, we appreciate it when, you know, we're given that advance yeah. notice. Thank you so much, Tim. And what about a student that may have had an IEP while in high school? What do you offer to help ensure that once they're on your campus, they continue to be successful? Yeah, well, I think um, I don't think the application is a time to shy away from something like that. I, I think you throw it out there because, you know, if we're going to admit somebody, if we don't know that someone, you know, has an IEP or, or needs special accommodations in this area, then, then we're not going to know to tell our folks on campus, hey, you know, so-and-so needs, needs these efforts. Um, so I think that's important, right? Be open and honest about that in the application process. Um, and then, you know, we, we have a number of different services on our campus, support services, uh, tutoring, um, you know, any accommodation a student needs, we'll, we'll provide it for that student. But I think it's important that a student makes, you know, they self-advocate for that. Right. Um, if if someone had certain um, accommodations made in high school, it doesn't necessarily mean it, it, it'll transfer over at the college level. But, um, you know, that's something students should ask about when they visit campuses. They should speak to the person in charge of, of those services on campus. Um, they should speak to their advisor. And I think as long as students are open and honest about themselves and, you know, it's not a negative, right? It's it's just this is what someone needs in order to to make the most of their college experience. Um, you know, they they just need to self advocate and and make sure that um, you know they ask those questions, especially during the decision making process. You'd hate to get somewhere and realize you didn't ask this important question, and and you know maybe something's not offered in the same capacity that you had in high school. Well, we appreciate that. And Tim, before we end, are there any questions that I didn't ask that you wish I did? Or is there anything else you want to leave us about Lemoyne College? No, you know, um, I think you asked a lot of great questions. You know, I, I think um, I think sometimes, you know, a lot of families get caught up with a name brand or, you know, um, you know, they look at their 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 rankings. Um, and I think students and families have to see, OK, what's most important to them? Right. Um we're really proud of, of the fact that uh, we're, we're highly ranked. We're proud of the fact that we're value. And we like to say that when you combine those two, no other private school in New York State, you know, provides value with, with the results that we have, like, like Lemoyne. Um, and it really comes down to, you know, what you're looking for, right? Uh, I, I worked at a large state institution previous to Lemoyne, and um, some students want that 600-person lecture hall and, and kind of disappear and you know, um, if they meet their professor, great, right? If not, they'll get to know the teacher's assistant or, or the grad assistant up there. Um, you know, we pride ourselves on the individualized attention, right? Um, if a student falls through the cracks here, it's because they choose to not take advantage of those opportunities. And I think that's really important. And that's why our retention is really high. That's why our, our job placement and, and grad placement is, is really high. We, you know, uh, one of our seniors just got into Michigan Law School over the weekend. So we're celebrating that on campus. And so I think these are all things that, that, you know, uh, I think parents and, and families should really consider when they're, when they're going through the process. Well, those are great pieces of advice. I'm glad I asked that question. And this has been a tremendous conversation, Dr. Lee, we really appreciate it. Unfortunately, we're at the end of the conversation. So let me ask, yeah. what are your top three pieces of advice that you provide students and their parents getting ready for the college admissions process? I, I think it's really important to stay organized, come up with a list, uh, dates, um, you know, you can be applying, you can be interested in 10 different schools that all have different dates and deadlines. And if you're not organized and if you don't stay on top of that list, um, you're going to end up making a hasty decision at the end of it. Right. Um, right. I think too, you know, there's really no early time to, to start this process. And I think 
when you know most most families think okay i have a junior in high school i should start visiting we we went away over thanksgiving to florida i have a freshman in high school and um you know it, right. it does snow in syracuse despite how beautiful it is um she right. doesn't want to go to college in the snow i also realize she's 15 and she doesn't know what she what she wants right <laughs> Um, but we went to Florida for Thanksgiving and, and we visited two college campuses down there. Um, it wasn't, you know, we didn't never say we're going to spend our vacation doing this. But as 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 we travel with sports and, and we visit friends in other parts of the country, you know, we try to carve out one day to to start looking at, at colleges because who knows when we're going to get down to Florida again. Right. And, and if my daughter really does want to go south. We, we got to either, you know, deal with that now or, or she's going to make a rush decision. So take advantage of those family opportunities when you're away. Um, if, if your high school or club or, or something is is doing something at a college, just don't go to the event. You know, spend an hour. And if you can't take an official tour, drive around campus, walk around campus, go to go to schools in your hometown. You may want to go away from 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 your hometown. But think about it. if you're if you're in Syracuse, you can go look at Syracuse University, which is a, a large research institution with with 30,000 students. And you can look at Lemoyne, which has 3000 students. And you may not want to stay in, in Syracuse, but at least you have an idea of what a large and small school is. So so you'll know what you like. So I think that's important. And then finally, I, I really think there's a college that fits everybody. Right. And and um, you may have your heart set on one institution and, and maybe they don't feel the same way about you. And, and no one likes to be told no or, or feel denied or rejected it's going to be all right. You know, um, many people went to their second, third, fourth choice and whether that's whether you got in or whether you can afford it. Right. Um, you know, th there's a place for everybody. So I think keep an open mind, understand that there might be setbacks along the way. And, uh, you know, if you do this correctly, you're going to make the right choice and it's going to work out in the long run. Well, those are tremendous answers. I really appreciate it. Dr. Lee, particularly, Starting early and even starting in your own backyard, you mentioned if someone happens to live in Syracuse, they could obviously visit Lemoyne College. They could visit Syracuse University, which, of course, are two very different schools in terms of size. But also when you're on those family trips, whether it's through athletics uh, or anything else, mm -hmm. take the time to go and visit. Like you said, you were down in Florida with your freshman and you visited some schools. I think that's great advice. Too many people start the process late. And that's part of the anxiety and stress that uh, becomes a part of it if you start too late. Like you said, mm -hmm. it's really never too early to start. So we really appreciate that. This has been a tremendous conversation. I know that this is going to help so many students and their parents. So I'm really happy about that, Dr. Lee. I can't thank you enough. And I hope to have you again. Awesome. John, thanks so much. And uh, look forward to it. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.